having dealt with some rather serious health issues recently, um, I found my life going in a different direction than I had previously planned. Um, and at times, it, no direction at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, during these times, how can I and other people in similar situations patiently persevere while still maintaining hope? Well, I, the tenderness of your tears and your voice uh, tell me how personal it is for you and how personal it is for all of us. You, you, you've really taken us immediately to, to this promise of Gethsemane. And yours is health. Somebody else's would be the children. Somebody else's is economic disaster. And on and on and on. A, A, first of all, foremost, you will not be tested. You will not be tried. You will not be pushed beyond your ability to withstand and endure and prevail. Now, that's a promise. It's God's promise. So I'm just, I just work here. Uh, you won't be pushed beyond hope. You won't be pushed beyond faith. You won't be pushed beyond uh, uh, what the future has in store for you. So that's the backdrop reassurance. And then you get the reality, the real life practice of saying, can I really, truly trust in the Lord? We use faith and we use hope. And those are two of my favorite words in all of the gospel vocabulary. But in my old age, and I'm getting so old now, uh, in my old age, an, an, a new word, an, another word that I hardly ever used as a young man is now uh, part of the fiber of my soul, and that's trust. And I'm suddenly finding it everywhere in the scriptures. And trust for me, a little different from faith and a little different from hope, is if you could picture... If I were leaning against a pillar here and, and at such an angle that I literally couldn't pull myself back from it, if whatever the weight and the angle happened to be that, that if somebody moved that pillar, I'd crash, that is not a comfortable position to be in unless you trust the pillar. <laughs> If, if this is anything unreliable, if this is man-made, if this is humanity and uh, with all its weaknesses, or us, me, you, with our weaknesses, that's a scary thought. If the fall is really a fall, not just a tumble to the floor, but uh, with eternal consequences and health and children and other people's lives. And my testimony to you is that when Joseph Smith used the word pillar of light, he chose that word and it was given to him providentially. It didn't say that he just saw light. It didn't say that he just saw illumination. It said he saw a pillar of light above the brightness of the sun, exactly over his head. And the Father and the Son appeared. They and everything good with them, angels and the Holy Ghost and a lot of really good people like you are the pillars of our lives. And they will not fail and you will not fall. Now, how you every day keep pulling. Talk to the mother with the wayward child. Talk to the man who still can't find a job. Uh, talk to the bishop who's got more welfare problems than he can deal with and his own economic future is in jeopardy. That we do together. That we help each other with. That may be a third party answer to prayer your friend's going to come over and say, well, I just had one of these promptings, and I don't know why, but let's go 
for a walk around the block or whatever. Uh, you won't be pushed beyond your ability to handle it. And other people will need to help answer your prayers, but God will be the pillar in your life. We want to think we're in charge. We want to think we got this thing by the nap of the neck. And nothing's going to be untoward, and nothing's going to be different than we planned. And it's going to be just like I thought when I was seven, and just like my Laurel teacher told me. And uh, the real growth periods, the real celestial, divine, refining, atoning elements of our lives, I think will almost never be those. Some of them might, but I think the big ones won't. It'll be how do you handle the pitch that's thrown to you when it wasn't the pitch you thought, and certainly not the one you dreamed of, certainly not the one you thought in the best of all worlds, this is how my Latter-day Saint life is going to unfold. Then we get to see the seeds of divinity that are, that are in us. See, we all, we all do this. We say, and rightfully so, we say, I cannot walk this road for one more mile. I cannot carry this burden one step farther. I cannot face another day. We, we, everybody has said that and will say it that I, I am to the end of my rope and I've tried everything I can try and I've done all the things that Elder Holland said and the scriptures say and President Monson has said and, and, I, and I just can't do it. And here's what happens. Here's what you find. And you know what I'm going to say. You find that the load you say you can't carry, you carry. And the road you say you cannot walk, you walk. And you walk it for another day, and you walk it for another week, and you walk it for another year, and you walk it for however long you have to walk it. And here's what's happening. God is revealing to you the divinity in your soul. And how else can he do it? We say, we say, we're gods and embryos. We're gods and goddesses. We're kings and queens. We, we, we talk about ruling worlds and planets and the universe. And I don't know how we get from there, from here to there. It isn't by the waving of a wand. It, and I don't think we just pop out of the grave. I don't think we just pop up out of the casket saying, Lord, okay, boy, I'm ready. Brant on. Uh, I, everything I know about the gospel is line upon line and precept upon precept. Everything I know is that way. And so what you're being taught and what he's being taught and what she's being taught is that there is divinity in you and you're a lot stronger than you thought you were and you can handle a curve better than you thought you could, but it is every single day. It is every hour. It is every week. Until you finally say, on this headlong rush down to a nosedive into a brick wall, is it possible? Is it possible that this thing is actually leveling out and that either it's different or I'm different? And I'm suddenly... Is it possible I am actually ascending rather than descending here? And you find that you're more divine. Well, you don't find you're more divine than you thought you were. You just f find that you're divine in a way beyond your laurel lesson or beyond the promise of your patriarchal blessing. It takes on reality and dimension and divinity. And I don't know how else we achieve godhood. I don't know how else we achieve divinity. I think we just have to be put in enough situations to say it really was in there. And I really do have more ability than I thought I had to face the day and to have hope and to commiserate with the mother with the child and the husband without the job. 
and you all answer each other's prayers. Pat? Having struggled with my own health issues, I definitely can relate. And I, whatever challenge we have, I think we need to keep the perspective that our purpose and our mission is not going to be measured by the few decades we have on earth. It's going to be measured through eternity. And I want you to take the long celestial view. And the one example I think of is <clears throat> the story of Leah. And you all know the story of Leah and Rachel. Um, you know they were two sisters um, who both married the same man. And when Jacob saw Leah, or Rachel, he fell instantly in love with her. And then the Bible goes on and describes Leah has, as having absolutely tired eyes, and Rachel is beautiful in form and lovely, and therefore we understand Jacob falling in love with her immediately. But then you know the rest of the story. They have, they have a very deceptive father. After he promised Jacob that he could marry uh, Rachel, he disguises Leah, and he's very upset with the father-in-law, and so he says, nah, you promised me I could have Rachel, where is she? He says, work for me seven years. And during all this time, here's Leah living by faith and having, having children. And she has four sons. And after she has her fourth son, she says, she, she says to herself, surely Jacob will love me now. I've given him four sons. The long and short of, the, of this story and the message to me is that when we read it, thinking, oh, lucky Rachel, Jacob loved her. But remember, she, she had Joseph, and then she had Benjamin, and died in Bethlehem, and she was buried in Bethlehem. And Leah lives on, lives on for a long time. In the end, he chooses to be buried by Leah. And at the end, he sings this beautiful love song to her. And this is in Hebrew lore. Um, about how much he, he loves Leah. Now, if you think about it from the Hebrew point of view, she, Leah had Levi, who was the son of all of our priests, and the priesthood, the line of the priesthood, and Moses and Aaron, and therefore the five books of the Old Testament. And then she has uh, Judah. He had King David. Uh, Solomon, we wouldn't have Proverbs were it not for these two boys. And as we know, the line of the Savior comes through King David. So without Leah, we would not have these wonderful books of Scripture, the, the patriarchal line, the um, royal line. We wouldn't have we wouldn't have our own salvation. We wouldn't have the Savior were it not for Leah. But now I'm sure she's rejoicing in heaven over the kind of purpose that she had and fulfilled and that she really helped to build the kingdom of Zion. Thank you, honey. Thank you.